Greetings, nail peoples. Hello. Oh, my hair looks fab today. Hi, guys. Come on in. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Hi. Oh, this is, yeah, I'm looking rocking today. Hi. Come on in. Come on in. Got to do the intro stuff here. So, um, I am Michelle Cordes Pugh, and it is April 5th, and this is Nails Over Coffee. Hello in California. Good afternoon, everybody. Evening if you're in the UK. Midday if you're over in New Zealand. We get everybody from all around the world here, so it's hard to say, you know, hello to everybody. Hello in Chicago. Oh, I love having you guys everywhere. It just makes my whole day, because I've been a bit of a grumpy gust today. So today, because I've been a bit of a grumpy Gus, I have Eeyore. <laughs> yes, in Tacoma. We're rocking the same hair today. Right on, Barry. All right. So yes, I'm uh, Alberta, Canada. Whoop, whoop. Um, yes, Eeyore is, uh, I, if I had Rain's grumpy cup today, that would definitely be more appropriate because I'm a little cranky today. Um, I've determined that I hate logistics. So I got the postcards in, yay, that are promoting. They have universe or they have nails over coffee on one side, promoting our fun little show here. And then um, they've, uh, I have clients to do later, so I can't be like hitting the bottle. Um, so coffee. Um, but and then I've got the University of Nails side. So they're all here and they're shiny, but postcards are really heavy to mail and they're even heavier to mail to Canada. Well, I mean, they're no heavier, I guess. They're just more expensive to mail to Canada. So, um, yeah. So i am been figuring out how to send these bad boys out. It does need to be nails over wine today. So I hate logistics. I hate it. Which led me to an interesting thing that I wanted to make sure I brought up with you guys before I talked about the seven P's of service marketing. Um, so if you've never done a me hating logistics as part of this, um, trade you, I'm working on inventory for Premier Orlando. Dude, I would take inventory anytime. Yeah, stamps.com. I just don't have time for these first two boxes. They need to get out right away. So I'm going to have to suck it up and pay the retail price because I don't have time to do the whole stamps.com thing. So the rest of them will go out later. But for right now, I have to just send these retail. And so, and there's 300 of them, which weighs three pounds, four ounces. And, um, yeah, it's kind of a pain. Hello. Um, so yeah, I just, see, this is the stuff I don't do well with. So that was what got me thinking. If you've never done a personality typing test, nope, you're right on time. I haven't talked about anything important. Um, if you've never done, now it's a psychological science, so it's not a natural science. So some people believe it, some people don't, but they still do experimentation, blah, 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 blah whatever. But if you've never done a Myers-Briggs personality typing you really should, because it's kind of cool. I've done it like a gazillion times over my lifetime, at least 12, and I've always gotten the same result, which I find really interesting, no matter what's been going on in my life, which my daughter, the psychology major, says that means I'm normal, because normal people don't have personality changes. I digress that I don't think I'm normal, but okay, <laughs> if it makes her feel better. Um, oh my gosh, this like crazy hair I've got going on. So, um... I am an ENTP in um, Myers uh, in Myers Briggs, which stands for extroversion. There's a shock. Intuition, as opposed to sensing, thinking, as opposed to feeling, and perception, um, as opposed to judgment. So it's sixteen different, or it's four different. Okay, let me try this again. It is eight different things that combine, what astrology sign am I? I'm a Cancer. Um, it's a, um, so it ends up with 16 different combinations of personality types. And um, 
I find that it describes me to a T. So just for giggles today, before I talk about the other stuff, um, I thought you guys would find this really funny, okay? So I'm going to read to you this because it's kind of entertaining. And it helps when you're having to grapple with something you don't like or a decision where you're kind of on the fence and you don't really know what you should think of. Or if you're going to go work with other people and they happen to know what personality type they are, it gives you an idea of how you guys are going to interact. We learned it in um, managing organizations in college. So um, uh, using their primary function, attitude of extroverted intuition, again, extrovert, big shock. ENTPs are quick to see complex interrelationships between people, things, and ideas. These interrelationships are analyzed in profound detail through the ENTP's auxiliary function, introverted thinking. The result is an in-depth understanding of the way things and relationships work and how they can be improved. To the ENTP, competence and intelligence are particularly prized both in themselves and other people. Dude, is that so me? That's so me. Um, there was one that I thought was particularly, one little comment in here I thought was particularly funny. Um, oh, ENTPs devise fresh, unexpected solutions to difficult problems. However, they are less interested in generating and following through with detailed plans than in generating ideas and possibilities. <laughs> oh yeah. My friend uh Cindy told me that when I the day I finished anything, she would bend over and kiss her own ass. So um <laughs> I did that was in regards to college and I did finish college and I did finish University of Nails and stuff, but hence the logistics part of what I'm dealing with. Ugh, I don't like it. I gotta hire somebody to do that. It's no fun. So I feel today's lesson is going to help me choose my bridesmaids. <laughs> That's hilarious. Maybe. You never know where these skills could come in. So I don't want to jinx it, so I'm not going to say the name of the salon, but I potentially have a salon room to rent out um, that I'm going to look at later this week. So in honor of that, I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about... Um, the seven P's of service marketing that you learn in the University of Nails and how the pieces fit together to help you make decisions. So for those of you who are new to the program here, the seven P's of service marketing are um, the four P's of product marketing theory, which is product, price, place, and promotion with three more P's added because it's a service industry. So um, that's people and physical landscape and process. So all seven of these things. So when we're talking about nail product manufacturers, they're working with the four P's. For us, we're service providers, which is the seven P's. So we have a couple different things to think about than people who are just selling a product. So, and that's reflected in the extra three P's. So, all seven P's in a marketing plan um, sort of work together like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle because you can't look at any one of them to exclusion of the rest of them. They all sort of have to fit together and all together they create the picture that you're looking for for your business. So if my neighbor's dog does not scr scratching at the door, I swear I'm gonna go over there and bonk him. Um, so the first piece, so as I'm talking my way through this with you guys, I'm gonna kind of bounce around um, because again, all the pieces fit together. So the first thing you need to think about is which what parts of the P's are non-negotiable to you? Because that's going to be kind of the bones of your marketing plan. So in this case, product is not um, 
<laughs> bonk in the UK is obviously different to there. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> oh, I forget slang sometimes. Yeah, bonk here is like hit with a bat. Smack on the head. Not that. Um, oh my gosh, you guys are so funny. I need to remember that I'm in a global room here. So, um, okay, so product in the service marketing piece is not the products that we use. That's part of process. Product is what we actually put on our service menu. So in my case, one of those things that's a really big deal to me is acrylic, liquid and powder. Now, because of all the hubbub over ventilation or dust or smell or whatever, um, I've had a real problem in my area finding a space that was okay with my acrylic nail smell. And for me, it's non-negotiable. Um, I just, I wouldn't go, I, I can't even think of an analogy. I just, I am an acrylic girl. And while I do everything else, and I have to factor all of that in, that's my one of my non-negotiable parts of the puzzle piece. So it, in my product on my service menu, I have my service menu laid out. I have the type of services I want to provide. And acrylic liquid and powder is in that list. So that becomes part of my non-negotiables. Then um, in price... I know my cost per services based on the product, my services that I've decided to do, and I know how much money I want to make. And so I have, again, those bones already figured out. And so now I have to look for the place that fits in that pricing structure. Um, product price place, we'll get back to place. Promotion. Um, I have built into my pricing model a little bit of flexibility for running promotions. So if I get into a place that's going to give me good word of mouth, like say a full service salon that has an existing clientele, I have built into my pricing structure the ability to offer a discount that's still going to meet my margin goals, I have um, a pricing structure that allows me to do some promotion to those existing clients at the salon. So um, again, when you're thinking about pricing, you have to decide if you're ever going to discount your services, you need to build that into your pricing model. Um, and I have some services that I never discount no matter what, because it's not built into the price of those services. Um, add 10% on to allow it, I do, right, yeah, you just have to kind of factor it in to your whole pricing model. So product, price, um, promotion. Now, um, I wonder if you like it, you guys are funny. Um, so now we talk about the service marketing parts, because like I said, I'm gonna get back to place since that's been my big hang up here. So, Physical landscape. I, with those other things, don't fit in a discount type physical landscape. I also, because of my own personality, don't fit into an overly foofy, foofy I guess would be the word, frilly um, salon environment. I am, I go more with clean, bordering on clinical with decoration, that's where my personality kind of goes. And so that's where my clients tend to kind of go. So as far as physical landscape, foofy, right? It's a technical term. Um, so as far as a landscape, physical landscape goes, I have to factor that in because it becomes a part of my process. So my process is what products I use and the client's whole experience from beginning to end. So, um, oh God, you guys, um, foof. Anyway, 
It is frilly, foofy, pink, fluffy stuff. It's just not me. Um, it is other people. Good for you. It's just not me. Um, so in talking about process, um, oh, you know what? I'm sure it is. You guys call, I swear to God, could the UK have any more words for, you know, naughty things and activities? Oh my gosh, you guys are killing me. I'm an American. You listen to an American show. So maybe I'm not a Brit after all, huh? I just have to come live over there for a while. I get it. Um, but you're getting me sidetracked. Okay, so um, in process, I want my entire client experience to be easy access to me when they need to, as a new client, to get information from me. I want information out there in such a manner that they can find a lot of it out without talking to me first and then they can decide. So I have a website and I have online um, booking capability and I've got that pretty easy to navigate and my contact form on my website dumps straight to my phone. Hi Liz. So, um, so that when somebody submits my contact form, it comes to me immediately. I may not be able to respond to it immediately, but it comes to me immediately so I know what's going on. Um, and I want um, my clients to not have a problem parking so that they're already frustrated by the time they get to me in the salon. And I want my clients to... Um, as a part of the whole process, I want it to be very easy and not frustrating. And I want to make them feel very pampered for the money that they're spending because I'm not the most expensive, but I'm definitely not the least expensive either. So I want them to, I'm on a value proposition. So I want them to feel like they're getting a lot for their money, which means no hassle. Um, so all of these things, yeah, and relax, all this. So all these kinds of parts of process have to factor into the search for place. So then value, not budget, correct. So um, then we come to people, which people's always the hard one. Yeah, and no bumping into the next previous client, at least not by much, like cross just a little, but then they they have to have a comfortable place to wait. Um, when that happens, or if I'm soaking them off, um, I have them come in a half an hour early. Well, I have to make sure that I have the ability to set them up and soak off bags somewhere that's going to be comfortable and comfortable for them, where they don't just feel like I shoved them in a corner, but also isn't intrusive on the client before them, who now they're taking up the last 20 minutes of their hour by soaking off. So, you know, and how am I best going to be able to do that? So you have to factor in all of those things when you start looking at stuff. So back to people. So as previously discussed and clearly seen today, um, my struggle is looking like super high end when I go to work. It's my struggle and I know that. So when I worked at the spa, I, had to be done, done, like really super fashionable. Black and white was all we could wear. Heels were pretty appropriate unless you were in the spa all day. Um, full face of makeup, hair fully done, just big deal. And that was great because that was the whole, that was part of their people. That was part of their process and their seven piece. But it was a struggle for me and and it still is hello um, not a makeup where I find it hard to look the part and so that's true so we just have to make sure that when you're evaluating the whole package that you get the right thing so I'm looking for a place where if it's an existing establishment um, I can look like I came to work on purpose right? I can put on maybe foundation or liquid to powder, cream to powder foundation. Um, 
I can put on mascara or have my lashes done. I can put on some lips and that'll be pretty much good enough. And I can wear my hair like this as long as I make sure it doesn't have any of this action going on um, on really busy spa intensive days or, um, you know, and then I can dress cute, fashionable, but not necessarily super high end. Um, I, if I've got a long day working in the pedicure chair where my clients are going to be laid back with an eye pillow on for the vast majority of the time, so they're not even going to really be looking at me, then I want to be wearing flats and minimal makeup and have my hair out of my face. Um, so I need to find a place where I can build all the rest of my peas kind of around that in my bones of my plan because I know that's what I'm looking for. Um, so you, you have to like think through all these things. It's not just where do I rent a space? So now to finish up with place. So you have to decide, do you want your own storefront? Do you want to rent inside of a nails only salon? Do you want to rent inside of a full service salon? Do you want to be an employee of a full service salon? Do you want to be an employee of a nails only salon? Um, where are you at now? Where are you looking to be in the future? Um, and there's nothing wrong with being an employee of any, whatever kind of salon and just saying, I just want to be fully booked and make fat bank being somebody else's employee. Like there's nothing wrong with that, but you still have to look at all the rest of it to help you determine where you're going to fit. Um, so the place that I'm looking at, so I was open to renting because I've been an employee and it just doesn't work right now with my other career goals. So I needed to rent and I was not opposed to opening my own space, but then it needed to be the right square footage and the right price and all of those other things or inside of a full service salon where I would lose a little bit of control, but I would gain that and some marketing promotion things. But the big thing is that unbendable thing of acrylic. So I have been looking and looking and looking at commercial leases and inside other salons and depending on what jurisdiction it is. And um, yeah, Mary, you don't fit in the, we won't say that word, those words anymore because our UK people don't get it, spa either. Um, girly, is that a word I can use? Um, so, um, so place, you also need to think about this, where you're at in your career. So I have been doing nails for a really long time. So I have some clients who come from really far away from places I used to live before or people who came to me on a referral and then moved further away or those kind of things. So I've been established for a while. So I have a little bit different set of geographical place requirements than maybe somebody else even in my area does. So I was looking for some place that was pretty centrally located in the big city I'm in, which put me in about like um, probably like a four mile radius around a certain area in my city. And I need to be pretty close to that. Otherwise I was too far for some of my people because I draw further from than, um, a lot of other people. So if you're just starting out and you're just building, then you have a little more flexibility in figuring out where you're going to go because you might not be fixated on a particular area. But then again, there might be a particularly good neighborhood or something that you'd fit in well that you need to be in. So, you know, all those things play together. And so uh, this opportunity is a full service salon with a room that has a room available for me to rent out of. It's a little girly, but not really. Um, I'd be the only nail tech. They've never had a nail tech in there before, though they've wanted one, they just didn't have room. And now due to some recent business changes, they have room. The owner is one of my clients. I used to work with her at the spa I worked at. And a couple of the other girls who work there um, worked with me at that spa. So, 
I know them, they know me, we know from a personality standpoint, it's gonna be okay. Um, the owner is looking into how everybody feels regarding me doing acrylics and me being in there and those kind of things because nail clients have a higher turnover per day than a lot of hair clients do. So in this particular salon, they do a lot of specialty color. Well, we know specialty color with balayage and um, some double processing and all those kind of things. There and then design work and stuff. They're only turning over a client once every couple of hours. Thanks, as opposed to um, some people who are mostly haircut driven and they are turning over clients once every thirty minutes. So you have to figure out how that, how your traffic flow, are you somebody who's turning clients over every hour and a half or every hour or every 45 minutes or right long visits for those specialty services. Um, I have a service I offer where I do both clients hands and feet while they're in the pedicure chair and it takes an hour and a half. Um, it takes, I book two hours if I'm doing shellac as well. It's a super luxurious experience. Um, that I have to factor in if I'm doing that. Can I provide that type of environment with the other people and the other turnover and services that are going in the salon? So you got to look at all these things. Like you can't leave any one thing out or it's not going to work for longevity. So this particular place, um, you know, hopefully um, it will all work out. That would be really great because I'm really excited. It's in pretty close. It's about a half a mile away from where I'd really, really like to be. But because of where I really, really like to be is really, really expensive and there aren't any rental type salons in there and I can't afford a space on my own there. So I'm about a half a mile out of there, which doesn't seem like a big deal, but when you're in a big city, a half a mile can be a big deal. Um, but it's not too bad and it's still, it's only two miles from my house. It's inside of that kind of core radius that I'm looking for. So um, that's all the things you have to think about. Like it's never just as simple as, hey, is, 50 pounds a week a good price for a booth rent like you can't really answer that question not really not intelligently um because you have to know all the rest of the stuff goes with it so that's exactly what the university of nails is for is to teach you guys all of those concepts and the inside and outs of everything so that you can do your own marketing plan, so you can do your own business plan, so you can make better business decisions, so you can ultimately make more money. Um, so in the workshop in Arizona um, here coming up in the next couple weeks, um, that's exactly what we're gonna do, is we're gonna work on each person's individual business plan. Um, in person so we can answer questions and we can troubleshoot and all that so um you know consider joining the university of nails shameless shameless plug um and that's sort of all the process of working my way through how to figure these things out so um do you guys have any questions for me about that. I don't know my rental price yet. I'm going on Thursday to really kind of scope it out and make the final decision. Um, so hopefully by the time you guys talk to me on Thursday, I'll already know, but if not, it might be later. Um, definitely should be by Friday. So we'll keep our fingers crossed. Keep our fingers crossed. So if you guys have any questions about any of the craziness I just said, what do you charge a customer that is on thyroid meds and needs new nails every week? Um, and am I putting in a chair? Um, I am going to use my existing pedicure chair for right now. And then I am um, hopefully going to upgrade to um, more of an aesthetics type chair. I like the hydraulics of being able to lift people up and down. It makes it easier ergonomically on my back um, for a massage all the way to the knee. Um, so what do we charge a client who is on thyroid meds and has to come in every week? 
It really depends on what their goals are. People like that, a lot of times I encourage them to wear a polish that's designed to last longer than a week, but is only going to last a week on them and come in for weekly manicures because then it's cheaper. It's just $25. If they want to wear enhancements and they want to come in every week, um, then I usually alternate. Um, most of the time they don't need to fill it the week. They just need whatever repairs are. So I'll do a $35 fill every other week. And on the alternating weeks, I'll do a $20 buff and polish and repair. And I'll work accordingly within that. Those are people that I would be more likely to use regular nail polish on as opposed to gel polish because I don't want it to take forever to remove. I need to be able to remove it quickly in between and they're not going to go long enough for it to get beat up. Um, so that's just really kind of customizing that service plan. The other thing I do with some people like that is I teach them what they need. I say, how often do you want to come see me? And say, they say, well, three weeks is really what I can afford. I want to come in every three weeks. Well, then I tell them, okay, well, then here are the products that you need to use every week. And this is what you need to do so that you can maintain your nails in between. So historically, I've had a lot of those people wear colored tips, white tips, green tips, blue tips, black tips, whatever, colored tips and pink acrylic because... Um, and then retail them a really nice um, acrylic sealant that's air dry so that I can send them home with the file and a buffer and the sealant and the cuticle oil they need to keep from destroying their stuff and all that. And I can teach them how to do their own little blend and buff and re-clear um, every week. So that then they can come in and pay me every three weeks, but that's because they're doing what they need to do each week in between. So, um, you know, that's back to that, just working on an individual plan with each client. Um, I really encourage my clients to tell me what their budget is, what they're looking to spend in both time budget and money budget um, for their nail services. And then we sort of customize and go from there you know, what their perfect nails look like, what their goals are with their nails. Would they ultimately rather have natural nails or would they rather have enhancements? Um, are they okay with committing to coming in once every other week or, you know, whatever. Or are they more once a month person, they need natural nails and they are going to do their own stuff at home in between. So case in point, today I'm doing a guest who she... Um, she picks off her gel polish. She's a picker. Um, oh, you're welcome. Um, and she peels off her gel polish. She peels off her regular polish. She peels off her acrylics. She used to bite her nails. Thankfully, she doesn't do that anymore. We trained that out of her. But the longest she gets with her gel polish is like nine days. And she comes every two weeks, but I never have gel polish to remove because she's already picked it off. We've never made it the full 14 days, not yet. We've come close. She had one nail left at 13 days a couple of appointments ago. But what she does do is after she peels it off, then she polishes her own nails to keep her from biting them, right? So my thought this time is if you can't beat them, join them. And I've already got her to stop biting. So I call that a win. Um, and she doesn't peel off regular polish because it's too thin and it comes off fast. So she takes off with the remover but she peels off anything else. So today for the first time, we're going to put Dazzle Dry, which is designed to be a long wear polish on her. We're gonna do a regular manicure. Um, and then I'm setting her up with exactly what she needs to be doing in between when she sees me. And so if she's still only gonna get eight or nine days out of it, but then she can just remove it instead of picking it off then she's um then she'll end up with better nails and she still has to do her own nails in between did commission first more education booth rent more education owner now both right um do you usually share which products you like for example the sealant <laughs> bind her hands up i wish 
Um, do I usually share what products that I use? For example, I try not to with you guys. I'm never going to lie to you if I'm asked directly. Um, I try not to because I really want to not appear to have, um, I will let you know how it works out for her. Um, I try not, I try not to appear to have a brand bias because, um, there's so much that goes into selecting what brands you use. No one brand is the best for anybody, any one client, any one tech, and anyone's business model. Like we talked about the marketing thing. Like there's no, if somebody says, what's the best acrylic product? The answer is there isn't one. What's the best gel product? Even if you say, what's the best gel product for me? I have to ask you like four dozen questions after that. So I try not to talk too much about the particular brands that I use and just stick to what I do with trials for you guys to see because I think when we see educational videos, a lot of times what we're seeing is an educator um, for the manufacturer who makes whatever it is look really easy, not the real tech pulling something out of the package for the first time. Yeah, it's whatever works for you. Um, and and playing with it. How does it, you know, anybody can make something look easy or good or right or whatever with enough practice. And so I try, I have 20 years of experience using the acrylic product I use. So I try not to talk about that as much because it's not necessarily representative of the results that somebody else may get. Now, if I find something that is super good and I think is a super good value, then that's something I try to share with you guys. So example, you mentioned sealant. I've actually said it a few times, so I don't mind saying it in the slightest. Um, I've really searched for a sealant that doesn't discolor at all over just acrylic with no gel polish. I can use this over gel polish too, but I was really looking for something that over pink and whites or lighter colors and pink. Um, Mare, I'll be honest, I use nothing but nail light products except for regular nail polish. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's, that's your thing. That's totally the way it's supposed to be. Um, so I finally found, but I found some that worked okay, but I'm not paying $20 a bottle for sealant. Um, that ain't in my pricing model. So, um, and like any business, you're constantly looking to cut costs without cutting any disadvantage out. You know, you don't want to introduce a new problem by cutting price. So that's that value part. So you have to think about it. So when the CYO gel came across my life to try it, um, I tried it. And um, while I didn't particularly care for the results I got from mixing the gel base with the polish, um, I didn't like the wear I got out of it. Again, just didn't work in my business model. Does for some people. Create your own gel is what it stands for, Mare. And I did some trials on it. If you go way back on the Facebook page or look in the pictures, they're in there somewhere. Um, but what I did find is the CYO gel top coat sealant is excellent. Um, for me, I haven't had any problems with curing. It cures in my LED lamp. It doesn't discolor really, except for on one client who I have to use master fill on, but I digress. Um, so it, um, and I can use it over gel polish. Um, I can use it, you know, I can use it as just a multi-purpose sealant. Um, I prefer sealants that have an inhibition layer to wipe off. The tack-free ones I find just don't seem to work so well for my clients. So, um, <laughs> right? I never digress. So, and it's only like $6.50 for a half ounce bottle when you buy it in the two ounce bulk bottle and refill your own bottle. So $6.50 is right up my alley. So that's what I've been using. 
um, works good for everybody. And as always, I continue to reevaluate everything that comes out on the market and look at where it fits in those whole seven P's. And that's the thing is that you really, when you get the marketing plan and you get the business plan, like all laid out and you know what it is, it makes it really easy to evaluate one specific component changing in and out and getting an idea of how it will fit in your total strategy. And it eliminates a lot of the, oh, but I don't know what to do. It eliminates a lot of that. So that's pretty much why I developed the University of Nails the way I did. And that's why I don't talk about which products I use particularly very much. But I'm not going to lie if I'm asked. I need to upload my Ask Me Anything from Periscope from a few months back to the University of Nails so members can see it because it was pretty funny. Because when people get the opportunity to ask you anything, it's amazing. They will ask you anything. And it was fun. It was fun. It ended up being a lot longer than I thought it would be on the list of Periscope stuff to upload. Um, okay. Anything else? We're at 40 minutes, so you probably ought to cut it out soon. Eeyore. I really like how these cards came out. Careful what you wish for, right? Uh, can I join University of Nails? It's, yeah, it's um, $10 US and the um, payment processor automatically converts the currency to what to charge you and what to give me. So um, you just have to go enroll and it automatically converts it. So it's 10 US dollars per month. And yeah, um, I don't have a licensing requirement on the University of Nails. It's universityofnails.com. And the reason why I don't is a very specific reason. Um, it's that there's a fine line since I'm not manufacturer sponsored. There's a fine line and I'm not a licensed instructor and we don't have a, um, <laughs> I wish we could get a degree in four years from University of Nails. No, but it will take you significantly less time to get a certificate of completion in the business of nails. Um, so where was I going with that? University of Nails. What was I saying? I got sidetracked with the four years for a degree thing. Oh, the reason why I don't have um, a licensing requirement. Thank you, Sarah. The reason why is that there's a fine line between um, being an educator and being an instructor. And there's a fine legal line that I have to sort of walk very carefully. And so by not asking for licensure, I am not promoting myself as a licensed beauty school. So it's more that I'm selling a product and the product that I'm selling is education. So I have to walk a real fine line with that. So that's why there's no licensing requirement. That being said, as it's been explained, if you're not in the nail industry, like anybody who's an independent professional beauty service provider would definitely get benefit out of the University of Nails. But to be honest with you, if you're not a nail tech, I think it would be really boring. Like it's really specifically tailored to nail professionals. And I think that it would just be a total snooze fest that nobody would waste their money on if they weren't a licensed nail professional. So for me to pay the extra money to not have to worry about that little licensing requirement word isn't worth it because I think it's kind of self-policing because I don't think anybody who isn't a diehard nail person is going to spend the money on it. They're going to think it's boring and they're going to be like, I'm not paying for that. So um, anybody can join. Um, I have a couple of nail tech manufacturer educators who are members. Um, it's really good for them because they keep kind of an idea of what all the other nail techs are looking at doing. And it sort of helps just kind of elevate everybody. So, um, you know. Um, I saw the anxiety post. It notes a uh, video that you share. I struggle sometimes before clients. That um, could be future subject here. Absolutely. Absolutely. I will look into that. Um, my daughter's a psych, uh, psych, psychology major. Psych major. 
I don't even know what it is because I say psych all the time. Um, so I'll talk to her about that too. Um, because of course there are differences between social anxiety disorder and general anxiety disorder, um, and those kind of things. So, um, so I will talk to her and I'll talk to a few other people. I'll talk to her professor who I really like, um, and see if I can find out some stuff. Um, I learned a lot from her about doing a thing called mindfulness. Um, huge anxiety after 24 years, fully booked. Yuck, right? And I have a general anxiety disorder that I openly talk about. Um, so I'll see what I can find out um, about that for, and see if we can come up with a way I can teach you guys mindfulness, um, at least a working little bit of it, so that um, maybe you guys can implement some of that into... Um, your business. Just kind of some zen nail tech psych woo stuff. Yeah. See, I needed time with you guys today. I feel so much better. Okay, now I got to figure out how I'm going to send 300 of these guys to Edmonton uh, area and to um, Oregon. Um... So I got to figure that out. I hate that my mobile clients are so against visiting the salon I'm now in. Yeah, that's kind of a bummer. It's tough. I had to let a few go um, when that happened. And they just became not worth it anymore. Um, send me. I'm going. <laughs> um, where are you at? You're going to Edmonton? Where are you at now? Oh, I can't because I need time for Dana to put them in the swag bags. Although I do have some other stuff I could probably send with you to Edmonton. Who are you? I don't recognize you by your screen name. Um, tell me who you are. Um, North Battleford. Jennifer Price. Oh, hello, Jennifer. Um, yeah, I gotta send him to Dana. She's gotta have time to get him in the swag bags. Hi. Um, so this time I really can't. Got to do it myself. Um, so, all right, I'm going to cut this off for anybody that were boring to tears watching it in the YouTube replay. And uh, you just registered today. Yay, good for you. I'm hoping that I get enough people to my Arizona class. So if you're anywhere in the Southwest, please come sign up for my Phoenix workshop so that I can make it happen because I need 10 to make it happen. Um, so please sign up. Please, 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 please tell any of your nail friends or share the University of Nails flyer from that page. Please share it so that we can get at least 10 people. It's 50 bucks a person. Come on. Who can't fork out 50 bucks a person for six hours of intense workshop learning? So, um, all right, guys, I'm out of here. Uh, I will see you tomorrow. And um, I'll keep an eye on the groups and see what I can come up with that doesn't include me losing my mind with any leading industry people. That's all we'll say. All right. All right, you guys, I'm out. Um, please share videos. Please like the University of Nails and Nails Over Coffee and subscribe on YouTube and join the University of Nails.com for 10 US dollars a month and blah, 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 blah. All those plug in things, right? So, um, thank you. Thank you for joining me. You're welcome. As always, I adore my tribe. My tribe gets it. Good night in the UK. Have a good rest of your day tomorrow in uh, New Zealand and Australia, you guys over there. And um, I will try to have a good rest of my day here over in good old Washington State in the US of A. All right. Ciao. Arrivederci. Goodbye. Hasta luego. Hasta mañana, actually. Bye. Happy nailing.